Well, uh, I mean, maybe we can start anyway. Um, so we're going to do this anyway because there are recordings and uh, uh, we, we can start already. It's, uh, we cover the intro and then people coming in, but uh, that's also fine. Um, so, so it does matter. Um, okay, so uh, good morning, <laughs> two of you, and uh, welcome. Um, so this is the, the data augmentation uh, for conversational AI uh, tutorial. And uh, in principle, we are four presenters. Um, so myself, Evangelos Canulas from the University of Amsterdam, uh, Roxana, uh, who is a PhD student also from the University of Amsterdam, Haydar uh, from Radboud University, and Paye, uh, who is online and will talk briefly about uh, evaluation. And uh, we do have uh, uh, quite some supplementary material if you are interested to dive uh, uh, more into the uh, the whole topic. Uh, so we have written um, a survey um, that you can find on online and on archive now as of yesterday. Well, probably it's not uh, uh, published yet. So it was submitted yesterday uh, with a lot of the information and all the, the citations and the references uh, of, uh, of the work. Um, so let me very quickly jump already to the to what we wanted to do today. So, what is this tutorial about? Uh, so, conversational AI it it has a big you know right now big hype uh, with the LLMs uh, being out there. Uh, so people for many years they're trying to build uh, conversational systems or dialogue systems. Um, this tutorial is not going to be about the dialogue systems themselves, uh, right? So we're not going to talk about how we build these dialogue systems, although we will briefly touch upon this because we need to know that uh, for what we're going to talk about. But we will mostly talk about uh, uh, how do we generate data to train these dialogue systems, right? So the idea is that uh, uh, these uh, uh, systems, they require training. And uh, as we will see very, uh, very briefly, there is a scarcity of uh, uh, day training data. So we need to figure a way uh, to generate more data for the particular domains we're interested in. Uh, let's assume that uh, you, know, you, you want to build a dialogue system for a particular domain or a task that you, you, you want to focus on. So how do we develop data uh, for this uh, uh, particular domain? And so in principle, you have a bunch of knowledge sources. Uh, uh, so you start from somewhere to generate data. This starting from somewhere could be some web documents where you start generating dialogues against these web documents. It could be knowledge graphs. You start generating dialogues against these knowledge graphs. They can be knowledge in, the, in terms of the uh, you know uh, LLMs themselves, right? So basically you can have an LLM that already contains knowledge and so it can allow you to generate dialogues, data, uh, training data itself, or you can pick you know, existing dialogue data and you can augment them. So this is gonna be the, the tutorial about the reason we touched upon, right? So why do we need to create data? Uh, and the, the point is the data scarcity that, that exists nowadays, right? So as uh, I just said, uh, conversational AI systems typically are deep learning systems, so uh, large language model systems that they uh, they require large amounts of data to be trained. And uh, this is uh, so this amount of data to be trained is the key to the to the success of these models. So we do need this data, and uh, so far most of the people they have been using crowdsourcing, right? So they do most most of the times they do this uh, Wizard of Oz experiment, where in principle. Uh, uh, there is a, a, a user uh, playing a role of a seeker and another user playing the role of a uh, uh, of someone that provides information. Come on, guys. So we just started. Um, so basically, uh, what people do through crowdsourcing uh, is they, they 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 create this sort of game between a seeker and uh, and someone that provides information. And so the seeker asks questions and the one providing information probably has access to this data uh, to the data sources that we just talked about right and so they can answer this question so through this sort of simulation of a real environment so a seeker and a provider of the answers uh, people uh, are now build these uh, big data sets 
Um, now, crowdsourcing, we know it, it comes with uh, its benefits, but it also comes with uh, its uh, 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 drawbacks. Uh, so one of the drawbacks is that it's really expensive. Um, despite being cheap for what it is, it's still expensive if you want to create large amounts of data. Right, so uh, this is the conversation QA data set, for example, that they build about uh, uh, 100,000 uh, uh, question answer pairs in terms of uh, conversations, about 8,000 conversations. So there was a bunch of turns for each conversation. Yeah, uh, they spend about $30,000 uh, uh, to, to do that. And that's not expensive for what it is, but it still remains expensive to build such a resource. So for whatever domain or whatever task you want to build this kind of data, you need to actually uh, uh, put forward this kind of uh, uh, costs. It's also time consuming. And uh, what it is uh, also interesting it is that building this conversational and dialogue data uh, it actually comes with a lot of challenges. It's not as simple as uh, uh, having a crowd, two crowd workers uh, asking and uh, responding to sim simple questions. When you want to build a dialogue, you have to, uh, it's a complex task. You have to remain uh, conscious of what the dialogue has been so far so you can continue building this dialogue. And it is uh, quite of an involved task for the crowd workers to, to do. So, um, data augmentation comes as a as a as an alternative. So basically, an alternative to building data using uh, 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 crowd workers. Uh, so instead of doing that, you essentially develop synthetic uh, synthetic data. Now, um, one may ask. Now we have LLMs, right? And uh, most of the dialogue systems nowadays they are LLM based. So if uh, we do have LLMs that are few, we know they're few shot learners, right? With some examples, uh, in principle, you can you can um, turn LLMs towards uh, responding to the to the questions you have, right? So imagine you're you have chat uh, GPT, GPT-4, and then that's already a great dialogue system. You can already start asking questions. You can have a conversation with it, and uh, you know you can steer the conversation. So basically, if we have ChatGPT, why do we need to to do data augmentation? Why do we need to develop specialized data for conversation? Right. So we know that ChatGPT is not trained on this kind of data. Well, most of it. Uh, so we can, in principle, one would say that with LLMs, uh, you can skip this whole thing altogether and you can just focus uh, on uh, uh, the training of LLMs as it happens. So you do some instruction tuning, uh, you do the pre-training and that's it. So in principle, uh, this is true for uh, a part of the, of, the, of, the, of the problem, right? So uh, uh, for uh, when you have uh, generic questions or generic conversations, then you can have these conversations with the LLM then the problem starts being created when you move away from the general uh, uh, domain and you start moving towards domains that require specific specialized data, right? So imagine you want to build a dialogue system on a particular set of products, right? So you are Amazon or you are, you know, you're a, a pet uh, shop and you want to have a dialogue system that works with your own uh, data, data that the LLM did not have access to or data for which you don't have uh, you know, the, the, you you don't you haven't trained the LLM on. Of course, there are other solutions, right? Nowadays, people do retrieval augmented generations on all these things. But one way to go, uh, you could go forward with, is to develop training data for this particular domain, right? Uh, also, oftentimes there are sensitive data, data that also the LLM has not seen, like healthcare, uh, you know, uh, security in the security domain, the bank domain. So these are data that the LLM has not seen, and therefore still you require to, to develop training data to, to be able to work on this uh, sort of uh, domains. Uh, also oftentimes, uh, so we, we, we have LLMs as a panacea, so we can use LLMs all the time, but, but if you go to the sort of real world, in, industrial world, oftentimes using these LLMs is not uh, uh, the best option. They are not cheap. Uh, they run outside your domain, uh, so uh, uh, so your budget may not uh, allow uh, to to use this uh, this kind of uh, of models. Now, 
On the other hand, LLMs themselves, they can be used towards producing synthetic data. And this is something that we have seen a lot uh, recently. Uh, and this is something that uh, we will discuss in this in this tutorial. So uh, this is a very rudimentary example that uh, came about uh, in a paper two years ago. So people uh, simply, you know, would give a, a prompt to an LLM. So it says that, you know, you're a chatbot, you know, you're, you're an intelligent assistant, uh, initiate a conversation, blah, blah, that, uh, you know, it's about 15 turns. Uh, so there's a description, there is a, a, an example. So this is the prompt. And then the LLM would generate a, an example, right? So very rudimentary, we will see, of course, that, you know, you can go only, uh, you know, uh, not, not very far with this kind of approach, just like that, uh, without any uh, sort of guidance of the LLM. Uh, but uh, you can see that LLMs uh, are being used uh, towards generating uh, generating data. Now, um, so this is about the data augmentation part of the tutorial. So the, the, what, what we want to do uh, in this tutorial. So we want to talk about, again, not how we build conversational AI systems, but more how about we build data to train conversational AI systems uh, on. Uh, when we come to conversational AI itself, uh, yeah, this is, a, as, as I said, this is a, 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 a field that um, has been around for a while, right? Back in the 60s, uh, people used uh, more of rule-based systems uh, where there were specific rules of how to respond uh, to user turns uh, on from, uh, from the size, side of the system. Then as we move towards a more machine learning era, so the, all these agents, agents, they combine machine learning with rule-based, uh, and uh, we, we start seeing things like Siri and Amazon Alexa. So these are a, sort of a mixture of uh, rule-based systems uh, and machine learning. And then slowly we move towards the deep learning era where most of the systems now are being built end-to-end -end, uh, uh, and they're data-driven. data, data -driven. In this tutorial, we will talk about three types of systems, okay? Um, now, we, we separate them because the literature separates them. So the literature is not, is not very clear about all of this, um, but uh, let, let me explain how we view it. Uh, but also, we separate them because each one of them has different challenges and different um, uh, requirements. It is evaluated differently, and in principle, it, there are different goals in, uh, in all these different systems. So we split the dialogue systems into three categories, uh, task-oriented, open domain, and conversational information seeking. Now, this last one, you don't see it very often. Uh, it's somehow embedded in the other two. But because we come from the information retrieval community, uh, we, we do think that this is a special, a special case uh, as well. So the task-oriented systems are what uh, we, you know, I think, Everyone agrees pretty much what they are. They focus on a task completion. Imagine you want to book a restaurant or you know uh, holidays. So you have a very specific task that you know exactly how to model, right? That you know the variables that are uh, involved. If you want to make a restaurant booking, you know that you need to find uh, a restaurant. So that's uh, you know the entity you need to find at the end. And this restaurant has particular attributes. Uh, it can have a particular cuisine, it can have uh, uh, um, uh, uh, a location, a time that it's open, and so on and so forth, right? So you can model the problem very clearly, and then you, you want to solve this specific uh, problem, right? Um, so this is a particular type of uh, task uh, of, of, uh, of dialogue systems, task-oriented systems. Then there are the open domain systems, and there... In principle, th this is a, a more of a conflated category, but uh, we're going to focus, uh, when we talk about open domain, we're going to mostly mean these social bots, more or less, right? So um, um, essentially dialogue systems that they you can talk to, they you can talk to about anything, so they're not uh, restricted to a specific domain. And uh, in principle, they, they have the requirement to, to engage in a reasonable and informative uh, uh, conversation with, uh, with the user, uh, but they don't solve any particular task, right, per se. Um, and then we split away the conversational information seeking uh, uh, dialogues 
uh, which are, in, in my at least in my opinion, they uh, they solve a particular task. So they are close to the task oriented, but they are also not exactly task oriented because the task they try to solve is to provide information. So it's like an information retrieval system. It's just that you access to information through conversations, right? So it is. Um, uh, they have one task, and that task is to provide you information about a particular uh, uh, a specific, let's say, need. But they are also open domain in the sense that they are not focusing, they are not built for a specific task, right? So they, in to some extent, they are a combination of the previous two, a special combination of the previous two. What you should think about uh, of these conversational information seeking systems is that they're really information retrievers that uh, they, they, they bring you closer to a particular information so you will fulfill your information need through a conversation. Now you could dive uh, very briefly in each one of them. Um, so when we talk about the task-oriented dialogue systems, as we said, right? So in principle, you try to, to solve a particular task um, so the user comes in, expresses the the you know the the goal. I want to book a restaurant. So you need to have a sort of a natural language understanding unit that understands a bit uh, the specification that the user gives. Right? Okay. So we're looking for a restaurant, and maybe the user says, "I want to book a restaurant for tonight." So you realize very quickly that already one variable has been filled in. It's tonight. So the time is tonight, right? So you kind of have a model of the whole problem of booking restaurants, and you have to have an understanding of uh, what does it mean uh, when the, the user says something and what can I fill in. You also have to be able to track. Here it's like tracking what has been filled in regarding variables that tonight is a variable. It has been filled in. So I don't need to ask uh, again, when do you want to booking? When do you want to have the booking for, right? So I know that this is covered so I can ask other questions, right? And then the generation, naturally you start generating uh, uh, questions towards the user. Now there are a bunch of, uh, when we talk about task oriented dialogue systems, there are a lot of them that you can train. There are still uh, a number of challenges that are that are there when it comes to this type of systems. The key challenge is this domain transfer, right? So imagine that you have built a, a dialogue system in booking restaurants, and now you want a similar one in uh, you know booking uh, some activity, right? Or you are uh, you know you are a, a provider, an internet provider. You have built a, a dialogue system that helps your customers to set up their internet, and now you want to have a, uh, to help your customers. Uh, troubleshoot a uh, particular thing that breaks down, right? This is slight tra domain transfer that you should be, you know, in principle able to, to deal with. Um, but this remains still difficult because the whole modeling change, new data is required uh, to, be, to be synthesized and so on and so forth. The second challenge when we build this task-oriented dialogue system is that, uh, you know, because we model the problem very specifically with variables, um, we're a little bit um, uh, constrained in a sense. While the, the customers, the users of these models, they use all kind of language to express the, what they want. So if you go to sort of uh, look into uh, retailers, for instance, like uh, Amazon with Alexa and, uh, you know, uh, uh, retailers we're talking to, uh, they do have this, this problem. When a user comes in, uh, they cannot cover, they cannot cover all the requests of the users. Users come in with very diverse uh, requests and they, they are always, uh, uh, you know, constrained to have 40, 50% of these requests. It is impossible to cover the long tail of, uh, of uh, what the user wants. So basically, if you think about it, think of them then as the challenges of, of generating data. When we generate data to train these systems, one of, these, of the challenges is to be able to generate very diverse uh, data that they cover all kinds of, uh, uh, of uh, user uh, requests. Right, um, so then let me jump to the open domain. So open domain systems, uh, as we discussed already, uh, they are systems that they are more of a social chat. So here the challenges uh, remain uh, are the being coherent, right? So when you have a social chat, you, you want 
uh, a coherence in the dialogue, but you also want to uh, remain engaged with, uh, well, with, uh, with the user to be informative and also proactive, right? So it's a social, social uh, board uh, that, uh, um, uh, that needs to be uh, discussing uh, with, uh, with the user. And then going to the conversational information seeking, I, I already spent a lot of time on this, uh, but if we look into the challenges, um, uh, when we have an information uh, seeking, we also want to be proactive. So a lot of these information seeking systems nowadays, they are very good at responding to your questions, but when they, there is uncertainty, they, they never ask clarifying questions, right? So if you also look at an LLM, uh, rarely uh, it comes back asking to clarify something when it has uncertainty. Um, so um, uh, we need to be able to, uh, to, to cover some of these challenges here. Um, so before we, we start talking about generating data <clears throat> uh, for, for these three types of uh, dialogue systems, what we want to do is we want to spend time, a little bit of time on how do we evaluate uh, the generated data, right? So what we, as, as I said, right, what we're going to do in this tutorial, we're going to talk about data synthesis, data generation for dialogue systems. So now imagine that you come up with an approach, you generate data, how do you evaluate the data that you generated with respect uh, to, to whether they are good to train your system on? And as we will see uh, very, very quickly, one way is to train your system and see how it works, right? Uh, and so that is one way to do it, but there are other ways to, uh, to evaluate the, the data itself that you have generated uh, uh, before you start training any system. Um, so I'm gonna give, I don't know if there are any questions on this introductory part, right? So we're gonna do the the we're gonna go as as it is here. So we're gonna talk about evaluation. Uh, then we will talk about task oriented systems. We'll have a break for a coffee, and then we'll talk about open domain and conversation information information seeking after after the coffee. I will give the floor to Faye, who is online, to talk about the evaluation, and then we continue with the uh, with the next. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm gonna turn also the camera to the audience. So Faye can see you, but you can also, Faye, maybe you can. Uh, hey, uh, yes, I can. Want to open up your camera? Someone. Yeah. Yes, I have a Just a second, so I can also, yes. All right, yeah, go ahead. Um. Hi, good morning. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for showing the audience. Uh, it feels like I'm at home, <laughs> uh, in place there. Uh, um, I'm I'm Faye and I'm going to present uh, the evaluation part. Um, Evang was already told about the importance of um, having uh, uh, this uh, conversation generation uh, methods evaluated before knowing about the actual methods. So um, remember the the, um, the final goal of uh, data augmentation for conversation is to increase the quality or quantity of um, uh, training data. So one so and based on this, there are two methods of uh, evaluation: extrinsic evaluation and intrinsic evaluation. Uh, just a second, Paya, because somehow uh, we don't see your. Sorry, guys. Okay. Uh, you don't see my slides. No, uh, not on the on that screen. Sorry. Uh, let let me just do one thing. One second. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, go ahead. Keep talking. Okay. Uh, okay. Now we can. Uh, so. Okay. Great. <laughs> Uh, so we have two methods of extrinsic and intrinsic evaluation. In the extrinsic evaluation, we want to train the dialogue model with this synthetically generated data, maybe part of them or all of them, and then evaluate uh, on the performance of these down downstream tasks. The idea here is that the performance of these downstream tasks um, uh, are a good indicator of the, the quality of the generated uh, synthetically generated data. Uh, we can also do uh, do the evaluation directly on conversation. Uh, so this is called intrinsic evaluation. Uh, there are some metrics for evaluating uh, conversations. Um, 
generated conversation. These are either human evaluation methods or uh, automatic uh, evaluation methods. And um, uh, so in the automatic evaluation methods, we have a reference-based uh, metrics, which means that we have a reference data like ground truth data, a data set uh, that is basically our reference, and then we want to compare it with our generated data. Uh, in on the other hand, in the reference-free data sets uh, or metric, we don't have any data set. Uh, we want to measure the quality of the generated data based on some properties. And then to complement the uh, automatic evaluation metrics, because uh, they are not obviously uh, 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 representative of the, the final quality of the conversation, we also have human evaluation. And there are also different methods for human evaluation. Um, uh, let me just state that uh, conversation evaluation by itself is a broad topic, perhaps it needs its own tutorial. So what I'm going to discuss in this, this um, part of tutorial is, uh, is some of these, these methods. And uh, obviously the list that I provided here is not uh, a exhaustive. And also each paper uh, that generates a, uh, a synthetic conversation do not use all of these metrics but some of them uh, so there is no consensus on which metrics are are um, suitable or best suitable for for conversation generation evaluation okay uh, let's focus on the the first uh, part of conversation evaluation which is automatic reference based evaluation uh, so these metrics are often uh, borrowed from the uh, natural language generation task, um, where we want to evaluate uh, the generated te text, uh, for instance, in, in translation. And then we have uh, this word overlap metrics that work on the utterance level in the conversation. Uh, so we have metrics like Blue Rouge, Meteor, uh, that uh, assess the n-gram similarity between the reference and uh, the generated text. Uh, in the second uh, group, we have the embedding base metric, which are proposed to overcome the the problems of uh, word uh, overlap metrics because they they are obviously um, there are multiple studies that show that these metrics do not correlate with human evaluation. Uh, so we have a uh, BERT score and BART score. Uh, uh, and then uh, these methods are designed to compute the similarity between the generated and referenced text using uh, contextualized embeddings uh, like BERT and BART. And then the last category is the subtask evaluation metric. So in subtask evaluation metrics, we want to evaluate some metadata uh, of the generated conversations. Uh, so this metadata can be like annotations of the conversation or even part of the conversation um, um, that are generated via this conversation generation method. Um, and uh, these include, uh, there, there are lots of them basically. Um, some of them are uh, coverage, co-reference alignment and exact match. Um, so I assume that the audience uh, know well about the blue rouge metric, uh, so this word overlap metric. And then I spend more time on embedding base metric and subtask evaluation metrics. So let's go to the BERT score, which is um, one of the, the uh, popular uh, reference based evaluation metrics. So BERT score obviously uses BERT. Uh, it assumes that we have a reference uh, sentence X and a candidate sentence X hat. So we feed them to the contextual embedding model BERT and then for every token in these um, sentences, reference and candidate sentence, we get an embedding vector, right? Then we compute the cosine similarity, the pairwise cosine similarity between every token in the reference sentence and every token in the candidate sentence. And then we take the max over this. So in the actual implementation of BERT score, we don't, they don't actually implement cosine similarity, but they use pre-normalized vectors uh, to reduce the computation to inner product. So basically, so it becomes like a matrix multiplication operation. Um, and then uh, 
Based on that, we compute a, a recall, which for every uh, token in the reference uh, sentence, we compute the similarity for all the tokens in the uh, in the candidate sentence, and then for precision, we compute um, uh, we basically match every token of the reference sentence to also the, the, the tokens of the uh, every tokens of the candidate sentence to, sentence to all tokens of the reference sentence, and then based on that, we compute uh, um, f score, right? Um, so uh, BERT score also introduces the notion of IDF, which is optional. So the idea here is that the words that uh, appear less often uh, 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 indicate more correlation with the overall similarity of the reference and candidate sentence. So the IDF terminology, the IDF weight that they use is like, um, modified IDF version as we know in IR community. So it doesn't look at the number of terms that uh, num number of times a term appear, but only uh, an indication function, an indicator function, whether the term appears or not. Uh, so uh, the study shows, their study shows that the effect of this IDF is marginal and it's also dependent on the domain and the test data. So often this IDF weighting is, is ignored in computation of red score. Uh, so uh, compared to, to this uh, similarity-based metrics, uh, like, uh, um, sorry, uh, lexical matching metrics like uh, blue and rouge, red score shows um, higher correlation with human on segment level, which means when we have a uh, two tokens that, that we two two utterances that we want to compare, um, uh, but uh, it is not effective uh, for system level comparison, uh, which means that obviously it is not effective for dealing with conversation because of the one to many nature of conversations. Uh, so Bart score improves upon upon Bert score, but Bert score is very often seen in the literature. Um, then we have the, the stops task evaluation metrics. Uh, so in the stop task evaluation metric, we have uh, like span coverage. Uh, this is used when we have, uh, when we want to generate a conversation based on a given document. And in this document, we have some text. We want to see how much of this text uh, in the document is covered in the generated utterances. So um, uh, the, the metric is very simple, so we want to so we compute the overlap between the the, the document and the generated sentence, and then we uh, normalize it by the length of the document. Uh, <coughs> the idea here is that the the dialogue generation models uh, the, that are trained on spans with higher uh, span coverage perform better after all on the downstream task. We also have the span match metric, uh, which uh, um, basically look at the exact match between the predicted span and uh, the the reference span. For instance, when we have a question answering and then the final answer, we want to check whether the final answer matches the reference or not. And then here we also use the n-grams and we compute the, uh, the, the F1 score. Um, there is also this co-reference alignment, which often appears in conversation, where we have uh, 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 pronouns that refer to certain entities or um, certain um, people. And then we use precision recall and effigure also for co-reference um, uh, alignment, which is also a metric that is used often in, in natural language processing for co-reference resolution. Uh, these subtask evaluation metrics are very often used in task-oriented dialogues. Uh, so in task-oriented dialogues, we have slot uh, and we have intent. Uh, so on the uh, so we want to measure uh, how accurately we capture these slots and intent using accuracy or F measure. Um, there is also a metric called zero-shot coverage, which is used for domain adaptation. So we want to measure 
the accuracy ratio between the zero shot learning outcome and also a model that is uh, trained using the whole data uh, by seeing the whole training data. Uh, on the conversation level, level uh, in task oriented dialogues, we have goals. Um, and then uh, there are different measure also, different metrics also to, to automatically measure whether we succeeded, the conversation succeeded to achieve the goal or not. So this is like success rate, uh, completion rate, which is either zero or one, whether we have the, the dialogue agent completed the task or not, uh, or the, the task that is completed, whether it's uh, accurate or not, uh, um, uh, using inform precision recall and death measure. So there are many metrics in this subtask evaluation, especially for task-oriented dialogue systems, which uh, which I don't discuss them here um, uh, completely, but they are found in the literature. So um, the second group of these automatic evaluation metrics, which is uh, which is commonly used and needed for uh, a synthetic conversation generation, is reference-free metrics. So let's let's look at some of them. The first category is diversity metrics. Um, so in this diversity metrics, our aim is to capture how diverse is the the, the generated uh, dialogue, uh, um, a metric that often LLMs uh, uh, show um, uh, less scores compared to human because the, the generated responses are not that diverse. So we have, um, distinct and uh, uh, entropy sentence birth and self blue so in distinct and we want to measure um, the ratio of distinct uh, unigrams let's say n grams uh, with respect to the total number of generated words so this is a very simple metric and then we have entropy which also looks at n grams but it it sees how evenly this n gram distribution is over all the generated questions uh, uh, the other popular metric uh, or two popular metrics are sentence birth and self blue. In sentence birth, um, uh, people use the uh, embedding, the final embedding from uh, that is obtained from sentence birth, and then they use the average of the negative of cosine similarity between uh, each pair of responses in the in the dialogue. Um, and the last one is self blue, which is a modification of blue. So in self blue, um, so the assumption here is that uh, every generated sentence um, can represent as as a hypothesis sentence, and then the rest of the sentences that, that we have in the conversation are our references, right? So for every sentence, we compare it with all, all with the all. Uh, uh, all of the remaining sentences, um, uh, which we assume there are our references, we compute blue. Uh, and then afterwards, we take the average of these blue scores, and this is called self blue. Uh, a very important note uh, here on these diversity metrics is that these are these metrics are dependent on the length of the data that we are measuring on. And this is an aspect that is often overlooked in the literature. Uh, what does it mean? It means that these metrics um, uh, tend to yield a higher score for lower data sets, uh, for let's say a smaller data set compared to uh, uh, larger data sets uh, or larger um, or text with larger amount of words. And this is due to the fact that when we have larger data sets, uh, the, the likelihood of or the probability of having repetitive words are higher than we, compared to the cases when we have um, uh, smaller data sets. So uh, if you just blindly take two data sets with completely different sizes, uh, one in the order of hundreds and one in the orders of uh, thousands and millions, then these two numbers are not directly comparable with each other. So um, uh, so what what is done sometimes um, actually by one literature uh, is to look um, to basically do the normalization, set a cutoff threshold 
for the number of words that uh, are used for evaluation. And then randomly sample dialogues until we meet, we meet that, um, uh, that uh, cutoff threshold. And then based on that cutoff threshold, uh, when we make sure that all the data sets have the same length, then compute this diversity matrix in order to uh, have a fair comparison. Um, okay, so these, these metrics that I mentioned, they are, they are just measuring the diversity, but then we have also, uh, we want to also measure the, the overall quality of these um, uh, uh, generated uh, data. So there is a work called USR, which stands for Unsupervised and Reference Free Metric for Dialogues. Uh, it consists of five submetrics, understandable, naturalness, maintaining context, interestingness, and using knowledge. And then it, it combines all these metrics to measure uh, um, one uh, overall quality metric. So in this way, the overall quality metrics that this model, this trained model, um, obtains is more um, uh, uh, explainable, let's say, or it's more transparent. So what does it do? Uh, uh, at its core, it uses Roberta and it fine tunes it on on some dialogue corpus. So this is unsupervised fine tuning, right? So it just did some data, some conversational data. Then for these two aspects of understand, understandable and naturalness, um, it takes all the uh, responses, all the words in the generated responses, and then um, takes the uh, like likelihood of uh, Roberta, because Roberta is a must uh, LLM, a must language model. So it uh, masks every token in the response it gets uh, the log likelihood probability from the Roberta. It's, uh, it, it takes, and then it sums over all of the terms, uh, all, all of the probabilities take the negative sample. And this is used for these two aspects of um, understandable uh, and naturalness. Uh, then uh, for the three other aspects, uh, it uh, fine tunes further uh, Roberta uh, on a retrieval task. So, uh, um, and uh, uh, it is fine tuned to predict the probability of relevance. Uh, why is relevance given the input, uh, which is like the dialogue history and the fact, and the current turn, the current response. So uh, after getting this, these numbers, which are all unsupervised, um, uh, it combines these metrics uh, using a regression model. Where does this regression model come from? Uh, it comes from uh, human annotation. So here uh, in, in the previous slide, they compute, uh, they, they get human rating for all of these aspects. They train a regression model. And then this, this you can think about it as a weighted sum of this, this, these five models, these five aspects. And then that regression model is used to uh, 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 to combine this um, this metrics based on Roberta, and then it gives a reference-free evaluation metric overall quality for dialogues. Uh, Unival is uh, follows um, USR, and then um, uh, instead it uses uh, a T five model, and it train it again on um, on uh, some uh, uh, dialogue corpus uh, unsupervised training, and then. Uh, what it does is that for every aspect that USR has, it turns it into a binary question, uh, uh, which will be a, a prompt to T5 and then get the score and then combines these scores to get the overall um, metric. So one, one note about this LLM uh, based models is that they are biased towards LLM generated um, text compared to the human generated text. So this is also something to, to keep in mind when interpreting those results. We also have a simulation based uh, evaluation, which is often used on target guided open domain dialogue system. Here we have two dialogue agents that um, converse, converse with each other. One takes the um, human role, um, which doesn't know about the target. But uh, the other one takes the agent role, which randomly picks a, a target and the starting point, and then 
uh, these two converse with each other after reaching a certain number of terms, we want to see whether the conversation meets the target or not. And the target can be just a simple word, um, uh, which gives the direction of the conversation. We want to see whether it meets there or not. And then this is also an automatic method of uh, evaluating conversations. So the last category of conversation evaluation methods are human evaluation. Uh, so you've already seen lots of uh, methods for um, uh, automatic evaluation, which are not, um, you know, perfect. Uh, uh, so human evaluation is a complementary method. Uh, but here we also have lots of methods. Uh, first of all, every paper uses different methods. First of all, there are different evaluation criteria like naturalness, informativeness, context relevance, uh, which are all dependent on the on the paper and the focus of the paper. So people use different evaluation criteria. And then we also have different methods of evaluation. For instance, uh, whether we use, a, whether a human evaluator evaluate a single model at, at a time or two pairwise models, two models at a time, or whether the evaluation is done at a churn level or at a dialogue level. So there is this uh, study. Uh, that was published in 2022 uh, that compared um, different methods of evaluation, um, combined them, <clears throat> combined all different methods of evaluation together uh, to have four different methods. And they compared them on three different aspects, evaluation criteria, which are preference, humanness, and interestingness. So the users and human raters were evaluating uh, method on these three aspects. And then they chose the conversation models uh, in a way that it makes it possible to um, evaluate or make comparison between different models with respects to the length of the response that they produce, the size of the parameters, um, the number of parameters that the models use, and also um, the fine tuning method, whether they are fine tuned on certain data set or not. After this comparison, what they found is that, of course, per turn evaluation uh, provides more fine-grained evaluation, and it can capture small, more smaller differences. Um, but uh, when it comes to pairwise per turn evaluation, they notice that this method performs best to capture the fine-tuning comparison, which means that it is it performs well when the differences in the in the models are easily detectable. On the other hand, for pairwise per dialogue evaluation, um, so it was most uh, it could capture the differences when uh, basically more on uh, the aspect of length of the generated conversation. So, uh, which means that it could capture uh, the differences that appear in certain number of conversation in certain num after certain number of turns in the conversation, and then at the end. Um, the single model evaluation, either per turn or per uh, or or single uh, or per dialogue, perform best on the model size aspect, uh, which will, which was like basically everything is the same, only the number of parameters are different, uh, which in this case it could capture the slight differences in in quality. So. Um, the after all the, the all the takeover from uh, this part is that. Um, conversation evaluation, both for human and automatic evaluation, is still an open problem, um, and um, uh, and uh, different papers use different methods. Um, I leave the Q and A for the um, uh, for the break and move on. Give the floor to to Oksana to. Um, Right. Uh, represent or to present the next part. Okay. Thank you, Faye. Um, all right. So let me just uh, 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 recap a bit where we are. Um, so in principle, we we still haven't got into the content of the of the of the the the, 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 the in depth content of the tutorial. Now we're jumping into it. Uh, so we've uh, done a very quick intro, and then we talked a bit about evaluation of the, the generated data with Paye. Um, 
so uh, let's uh, uh, I'll give the floor to Roxana uh, to start with the first uh, style of dialogue type of dialogue systems uh, uh, task oriented uh, dialogue systems and uh, what we will see here is uh, uh, methods to generate data and how to train uh, these uh, these dialogue systems uh, so the floor is uh, yours uh, so let me actually share also sorry so we've made a change here uh let me share again oops where's the zoom i think sorry oh yeah i have to take the zoom back sorry for that back here okay then yeah i want to share your slides share and here yeah Sure. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Angelos. Um, okay, so uh, as Evangelos also briefly summarized now, uh, this survey and tutorial covers three types of dialogues. Uh, and this is the first one that we will go more in depth. Uh, and it's called task oriented dialogues. Uh, and more specifically, data generation for task oriented dialogue systems. Um, all right, so first of all, I want to uh, explain a bit the concept of task-oriented and how it differs from the other types of dialogues. Uh, yes? Right. Um, so first of all, what is task-oriented dialogue and task-oriented dialogue systems? Um, these dialogue systems, uh, well, they represent conversational data that contain structured interactions. And you can see the structure and the types of input that these dialogues need and what kind of... Uh, keyword notations they extract that I'm gonna explain in a few slides. Um, and these dialogues uh, differentiate themselves from the others by focusing on completing a specific task, as Evangelos also mentioned in the introduction, uh, which also goes hand in hand with reaching the user goal. So for example, uh, let's suppose that you wanna make a reservation at a restaurant, then the specific task in this problem is reserving a table at a restaurant, but the user goal can be um, okay, you want a table at a restaurant, but you want it for 8 p.m., you want it to have an Italian cuisine, and you want to uh, make it for eight people, for example. So the whole idea is uh, the closer that you get to this uh, user goal or reaching this user goal, then you get maximum user satisfaction. Um, and uh, there's a lot of different tasks that are covered by these systems. Uh, these are a few examples. So uh, the restaurant uh, is a very common example, booking a flight. Um, or you can generally just think about the chatbots that you stumble upon on a daily basis. Um, so let's assume that um, you think about your mobile provider and uh, you go online and you talk to the chatbot. Um, and uh, from your mobile provider, maybe you want to cancel your subscription uh, or upgrade your subscription or uh, maybe uh, go from a, a monthly subscription to a prepaid SIM. Uh, so these are all examples of tasks um, for TOD systems in the same domain, which is, for example, now it's mobile providers. Um, so looking at these tasks, uh, we can also draw some challenges. And the, the main challenge of the system is there is a lot of constraints. Um, there is constraints that are um, task specific and domain specific. Um, and uh, also there are a lot of goals. So for example, going back to the restaurant, uh, you can reserve a table, but you can reserve a table in a lot of different ways. So um, there is just a very big variety in the, both constraints and goals. Uh, and this leads to the fact that we don't have data because data is extremely expensive and cumbersome to create. Uh, and this really doesn't go hand in hand with all of the variety that we need for these systems. Um, so this is an example uh, of a TOD um, an example of a dialogue. So for example, we have a user and a system interacting and the user wants to book a restaurant in Orlando for four people. So we already know the task is booking a restaurant and then the we have some specific attributes. We have the city of Orlando and the party size uh, of four. And then the system can already bring some recommendations. Uh, so some, some restaurant names. Uh, but the system chooses to extract more information from the user to make sure that it actually reaches what the user wants. Because for example, the user didn't specify anything about the cuisine. So there are probably a lot of restaurants that are available in Orlando for people. So then you have a few turns in which they gather more information. And by the end, when there's 
enough information to make um, a good um, recommendation, then it recommends the Formadon Garden in Orlando. Um, so um, I talked about TOD systems, uh, but indeed this tutorial is about generating data for training these kind of systems. Um, and uh, from what we, in this tutorial, what we did is look at research into all of these different types of dialogues, um, mostly recent uh, research and try to make some kind of, uh, bring some structure into it. And what we noticed for TOD data generation is uh, all of these approaches generate data basically using four modules. Um, whether they are uh, modularly trained, so each module separately and then just brought together, um, or end-to-end. -end. Um, and these four modules are uh, the ones shown in the diagram. Uh, so you have natural language understanding, dialogue state tracking, dialogue policy learning, and natural language generation. Um, now imagine that this diagram reflects a system that interacts with a user. So a user gives you a turn of the conversation and the dialogue system wants to get that turn as an input and then output the next turn, the next logical turn that um, has the goal of achieving what the user wants. So the first module, natural language understanding, basically only takes the user turn um, and wants to extract some information from that. So what it does, it gets um, a turn, for example, recommend me a restaurant in New York today. And it extracts the key information such as, okay, the task is recommend a restaurant in New York and then in for today. Um, this goes to the next module, which is dialogue state tracking. And what this does is um, given the information we just received and given the conversational history, uh, it wants to return the next actions. So what are the next pieces of information that are vital to respond in order to get closer to the user goal? Uh, and now going further to the dialogue policy learning, um, we have the next actions, but also we need some kind of recommendations for those actions. So for example, if now we wanna ask the user about the cuisine, dialogue state tracking says, okay, ask about the cuisine and dialogue policy learning uh, gives some recommendations. And then this goes into natural language generation, which now we have all of the information that we wanna give back to the user or ask the user about. And we just turn it into some human readable conversational terms. Um, as you can see here, the two middle ones, uh, dialogue state tracking and policy learning, they communicate with a data store. And data store uh, represents here a knowledge base, knowledge graph, some kind of predefined knowledge from where we can extract information. Because also what differentiates TOD so much from the other systems, uh, is that in, it needs predefined knowledge. Uh, there's no way a model can just know the restaurants in Orlando, so it has to extract them from somewhere. Um, so all of these uh, four modules that I showed you, um, they have to be trained somehow, uh, or you have to uh, make the, the uh, model actually know how to generate data. Uh, and there are two main approaches into this. There are two main approaches to generate data for TOD, which are rule-based systems and then uh, training with data. And I'm going to present both of them in the following slides. But you can imagine, uh, also as Evangelos described in the introduction, with rule-based, uh, you just have some kind of templates, usually. So uh, you have some predefined templates that say, OK, if someone asks for a restaurant, maybe always uh, reply with the turn, uh, do you want a restaurant that has cuisine equals question mark? Uh, but with training, we actually uh, have a model that knows how to generate data. It has some kind of knowledge into language. Um, and training happens mostly in two ways with TOD. You can have supervised training, um, which has some attributes, like it is indeed offline training and it needs a lot of annotated data, which is our problem that we're trying to solve. Um, and also there's a lot of reinforcement learning policy. Um, and this has the advantages of enabling real-time generation it requires less data, although still we need that data. Um, it simulates real, it, it simulates. Uh, I think that's the idea and that's why I made it in bold. Um, the, the word simulation is very important because I think, yes, I have it on the next slide. Um, what is simulation really? Um, any kind of conversation inherently uh, assumes 
two speakers at least, or two participants at least. And the concept of simulation is that um, you are a dialogue system and you want to talk to a user. But suppose that you do not have that user because of the data scarcity problem, we assume that we don't have access to data or to trained models in general. So instead of a real user, we assume that we have a simulated user. We have some kind of model that knows how to interact as a user. So you as a dialogue system can communicate with and learn through that. And this is what we call simulation. Most of the TOD uh, methods that we will discuss about use simulation. Um, and simulation can happen in two ways. Uh, it can be either one-sided. So you are the dialogue system and the simulated user is a pre-trained model. Uh, or it can be two-sided. So both the dialogue system and the user um, simulator basically learn together. And uh, this is one example. Uh, this is an example from a paper that we will discuss, which is called simulated chat. Uh, so you can see on the left and on the right, we have the two systems um, co-trained together. And uh, yeah, this is just a diagram to uh, give you an idea of how these systems look like. They have They go under a lot of different names in the literature. So they can be user and agent bot, uh, or system agent or dialogue system or all of those combinations and many more, but they mostly mean the same thing, just a two-sided simulation. Um, and uh, so while TOD systems are complex, uh, we figured out that we, uh, we found out that there are three main questions that you can ask yourself in order to get to a structured categorization of these um, generation methods. So the most important things are what kind of input you have access to, um, what exactly do you want to generate and how. So for example, do you want to generate uh, dialogues at utterance level or one dialogue at once uh, and the methods to do that, and then how to verify the generated data. Because as uh, we said, there's a lot of constraints that are task and domain specific. So any kind of dialogue that is generated has to be somehow verified because maybe in the dialogue you see a restaurant that doesn't exist, or you see that um, the, the dialogue system recommends uh, the hour 25 a.m., which also doesn't exist. So you have to, you need some kind of method to make sure that the dialogue makes sense um, and entity centric. And uh, following the three questions that we asked ourselves, we um, categorized the approaches into these three, uh, or based on these three parts. Uh, so first of all, the input, it can be either provided or not. So I will discuss this first, which I also think is um, the decision that really leads uh, the generation of data in general for TOD. So the input is very important. Uh, then the generation method, and then finally, quality filtering or checking factuality. Um, you can see on the right, we have examples of papers. And I will uh, very briefly go over them and how they are different from each other. So first of all, we look at the input. Um, and to get into input, I have to give you a few definitions. Um, because of again, all of the constraints that TOD systems have, there is a lot of uh, uh, different keywords used in literature. Uh, we try to bring it all together and make some sense out of it. So. Um, I will take the example of the restaurant because I think this is the consistent example on the slides. Um, when we talk about booking a restaurant, all of the, the whole conversation is around the restaurant. So we call that the entity. Each dialogue, each TOD dialogue has some kind of entity or class. This can be a restaurant, customer, movie, um, for example, and each of them have some specific attributes. Uh, attributes or in the literature, they refer to these as entities. Uh, oh, sorry, they refer to these as slots. So for example, a restaurant is described by a few attributes such as a restaurant has a name, it has a location, it has a cuisine. Um, and uh, if you attribute a value to these, which we call slot values, then a restaurant name can be um, gardens, Spring Gardens, I think it's an American chain, but it, it doesn't really come to me. Um, then, okay, so for example, cuisine, cuisine is slot, and then the value of a cuisine can be Italian. Um, a party size is a slot, and then a value can be for two people. So these three things, entities, slots, and slot values, are very important to track in a dialogue in order to actually um, 
keep track of what information has been achieved or what information you still want to achieve to get to a user goal. Um, and uh, this is one part. So the dialogues are constructed around entities, slots, and slot values. Uh, and then I said before that we need some kind of predefined knowledge, which you find in the form of uh, knowledge graphs, databases, schemas, or ontologies. So these are some um, some graphical uh, structured information where you can just extract, uh, for example, entities. So real restaurants in Orlando. And I want to briefly define the graphical structures um, because they, so there, there's four of them that we found in literature and they, they differentiate between each other slightly, uh, but it makes a difference to what kind of information you have access to. So first of all, we have schemas and ontologies. Uh, these are two structures that do not contain real world data. Uh, this means they only have the entities and the slots. They do not have the values. So you can know, for example, that um, you have a restaurant and a restaurant is linked to a reservation and you know that the restaurant has a name and a location, but you don't have examples of these restaurants. You don't have any kind of um, real restaurants in Orlando using this. So this is the schema and the ontology is very similar. The only thing that is different and how ontology builds on the schema is that you also have relationships between them. So you don't know just that a restaurant is linked or associated with a reservation, but you know that a restaurant offers reservations. Uh, and you know that a, res a reservation is made by a customer. So when you generate a dialogue using this, you also have these um, attributes in forms of verbs usually that you can use to link these. Um, so briefly, because you do not have real entities, the goal of this is you can use these to extract information and generate a dialogue um, that makes sense semantically, because you see how all of these entities are connected and what kind of attributes they have, but you do not have real restaurants. So the type of dialogues that you generate can still contain some kind of uh, fake information or invent restaurant that don't exist. And this is the limitation. And on the other hand, we have a database and a knowledge graph, which is like taking the schema and ontology, but you add real values or instantiations. Um, so a database is a schema that has values and the knowledge graph is an ontology that has values. So you can see in this case, you have the entity restaurant, um, you have the so, all right, you have the entity restaurant, you have the instantiation, which is gourmet bistro, and then you have slots like location, cuisine, price, rating, and then you also have their values, which is in New York, French, expensive, and five stars. So I would say probably knowledge graphs are the most rich structures that you can use in generating TOD data. Um, and these are the instantiations and how they are connected. Um, these are, this is an example. Uh, this is an example of a TOD dialogue and what the model keeps in memory. So you can see in the middle, you have a very short TOD dialogue with three turns. And then on the right, you see all of the things that the model has to prep, request for, um, inform the user for, to make sure that it reaches a certain user goal. Um, so you have intents, for example, okay, do you want to request information? Do you want to um, inform the user of something? Then you have a user goal in green that you want to you wanna make sure that you fill in as many slots and slot values as possible in order to reach that user satisfaction. Uh, so overall, there was a lot of information of the inputs because inputs are extremely rich in TOD systems. But the idea is that this input can be provided or not. And that makes the huge difference. Uh, if it is provided, you can just sample entities, attributes, slots, values, whatever, and then generate a dialogue. If it is not provided, then you have to find some kind of way to generate them and check them to see that the dialogue really makes sense. Um, so uh, that, that was the up part. This makes the difference between the, the papers. And now I will go into the generation method, which is also very uh, closely tied to the input. So you can see that we have three methods above and three methods below. The ones above do have input provided, the ones below do not have input provided. So this also drives in the way that you can generate data. Uh, and in this section, I will also briefly explain the papers. Uh, also, I'm not sure if it's clear, but the 
papers for each of the three sections are exactly the same. So this is why I choose to only explain it in one part because it's the same papers. It's just different ways of categorizing them. So provided and not provided. And um, right, for generation methods, uh, for the first three, right, we have input. Um, we have three main methods of generating dialog data. We can use predefined language templates, uh, or we can construct dialog around the input that you sample, or you can construct it conditioned on the input that you sample. So the first one is the, let's say, oldest one, I guess, the predefined language templates. It's quite easy, uh, but very cumbersome. So what people would do, they would define rules and outlines for generating dialogues. Uh, so you have an example in the middle. You have an example that says, for booking a movie, for buying a movie ticket, this can be associated with a template that says book movie with, and then you have the slot name equals blank. Uh, so all you have to do is plug in a value that you sample from the input or the, the knowledge graph. So if you have, for example, um, you go to the knowledge graph and you want to sample a movie, uh, you sample the movie with name inside out, and then you sample a date, which is tomorrow, and all you do is take those values and plug them into the tape, temple, template. Um, so this is very easy, uh, although it is it takes a lot of time, and now it's quite unnecessary. Um, but that's that's what people used to do, and uh, this doesn't create any kind of variety in the data, right? That's a very big problem. Uh, so most methods also add the paraphrasing step at the end uh, as a way to augment data further. So you don't only want one instance that says book movie with name inside out and date is tomorrow, but then you augment it to just switch some words and say, hey, can you please book a movie where I want to buy a ticket for and then you have multiple instances of the same uh, really example. So here we have three methods. Uh, we have Abus. Um, that does exactly what I explained now. Um, what uh, is the challenge that it addresses that it does use um, real entities, uh, which were updated in real time using RL. I think it's also the first one that used an RL policy. Then we have M2M, uh, which builds on top of Abus by enhancing generalizability. Um, and it does this by uh, being, you, you're able to provide new inputs so you don't only have one knowledge graph but then you are able to dynamically provide new apis which are associated with knowledge graphs so then it just generalizes to multiple domains um more precisely i think it was two domains which is uh, not a lot but then you have hgd which uh, what the authors do they say okay let's suppose that we have access to um they do 26 services 16 domains um, but they notice that these services have a lot of overlapping functionalities. So what they do is that they have one um, classifier that looks into your problem and says, okay, you can look into the knowledge graph of this domain, but you can also look into this domain because actually it makes sense for you to use both. Um, so this is how it builds on top of it. Um, and this is nice because then as you scale to multiple domains, at some point you don't really need to predefine uh, knowledge graphs for all of them because of the overlapping functionalities. Um, now, the second way of generating TOD data is uh, building natural language around the input, so around the entities, slots, and values that you sample from the knowledge graph. Um, so here we have multiple papers. We have, for example, NUS and Neural Walls, which are quite similar to each other. Uh, what they bring new to the table is that we moved away from templates. So we already eliminate handcrafted uh, templates or outlines um, which is great, uh, but it still needs to use API calls. Um, it is much more purpose-driven because now we don't have those rules. We need to actually use data for training. Um, and uh, all of these approaches built on each other with tiny incremental um, changes. So for example, you have neural walls um, that just gets rid of the handcrafted templates. Then you have NUS that as a dynamic goal generator uh, this basically means that you, you're a dialogue system, you discuss with, a, you converse with a user, and the user can just change their mind mid-conversation, and it's still able to, the system is able to pick on that um, and to change the way that, uh, or the attributes that it wants to look at. Then we have who's 
and uh, variational hoods. Uh, this is the same paper, is the same family of simulator as Abus and Nus. Um, but what they do is they take the input, which is again entities, slots, and values, and it doesn't just um, it doesn't just encode them into one vector, but it takes different features. So all of these different parts of the input, it encodes them into different feature representations. Uh, and it shows to have a, a better performance. And variational hoods, it also has a latent space, which helps in uh, generating more variety into the dialogues. And then we have TUS and the Just. Uh, TUS does exactly the same thing as HUS. Um, so it also has different feature representations, but it helps in generalizing to domains even more by encoding a special index that is associated with the domain um, or the task. So if you just want to change the task, you can just generate a new index and then it is able to generalize better. Um, and condition on input. Okay. And uh, this is just. Um, and here we have, I put this image to show another example of the two simulator systems. So we have a dialogue system and a user simulator and how they uh, they communicate with each other. Um, usually have one turn, which you see on the left, you have C, T minus one, it should be the context of the dialogue. Uh, and you generate one turn by passing it through both um, parts of the dialogue. Uh, and then you back propagate and then you uh, make them learn together. And finally, we have INA, which is quite a new paper from 2023. Um, it is similar in idea as it, it also uses simulation, also a two-sided simulation. Um, but this task is more difficult than the normal task that we mentioned, like um, uh, booking a flight ticket or a restaurant, because it does negotiation. And in negotiation, there's a lot of uh, intents that are very specific. So for example, uh, you want to decrease a price, uh, or you want to add something to the negotiation, another product. Um, and uh, yeah, this is uh, one, uh, one method that does simulation given input that uses GPTG. That's also quite different. The, the models are very different and also the quality of the data is quite different. And uh, now briefly going to the methods that do not have access to input. So I said we have three methods here. Variational inference is one that is a bit special. Uh, because we have variational inference and the next two use large language models. And the fact that we can use large language models leveraging their knowledge makes a very big difference in how we generate data. But variational inference doesn't have that. So I think this is a very interesting paper because it has no input to knowledge. Uh, it doesn't use LLMs. Um, they just model different uh, as TUS and who's uh, and variational who's. Uh, it models different parts uh, in different feature representations. Uh, it is able to generate dialogue, varied dialogue very well. Um, of course, factuality is not provided in any way because you do not have any kind of input, uh, but they also do not verify it. Uh, the author said, okay, we will just generate dialogues. We will generate dialogues in the TOD way, but they don't do, they don't make any kind of step for um, checking whether this information is valid or not. And then we have the LLMs. You have two ways of going about this. You have few shot learning um, or zero shot learning with prompting. So the difference is here you have a few iterations with in context example dialogues, and with the other ones, you don't. You just do it zero shot. Um, so as input now, you eliminate, you do not use any kind of knowledge graphs. Uh, you just give it an instruction. You say that, hey, can you generate one dialogue for this task? And I will give it an example of dialogues that are very close together and you can just um, uh, calculate that with the similarity and then it is able to generate dialogues. Um, so for example, simulated chat does it in two steps, human generated and then self-generated to make it more robust. And uh, with in-context learning, we have two methods, very similar, ICL, US and dialogue. So I will just explain this a bit. Um, well, actually, it's very similar to the other one. You just do in context learning zero shot. Um, so this is the methods. And finally, quality filtering or factuality. Uh, this is quite straightforward. So if you have input provided, you don't really need to check 
your facts. Uh, if you don't have it provided, you have to check your facts. So this is what I said here. All of these papers in gray, um, they're fine because they just extract information from the knowledge graph. VHDA, which is the one that does variational inference without input, uh, should do quality check, but they do not because it's very cumbersome and that's a big problem. And then there's the middle one, which doesn't use input, but they do apply some kind of uh, filtering, um, post-processing filtering. Um, and this can happen in a lot of different ways. I don't think there's necessarily one method that everyone applies. They look for over-generation and under-generation. So in the dialogue, you have, so for example, a method generates a dialogue, they extract the slots and slots values from the dialogues, and then they check with, for example, a belief state whether, okay, did we generate more or less? And then they can just eliminate the dialogues that feel that generated much more information or just omitted the omitted so much information that the user goal cannot be achieved. And uh, ICL US is a, a good example of how it does it. And I think it's also associated with this figure. Um, they call it automatic revision. And uh, different methods do this quality check in under different names, uh, but the, mostly it works kind of like this. And I think this is it. Um, if you have questions about all of this part coming from introduction until now. Um, yeah, we'll, 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 thanks. Um, we will have a QA and a at the end uh, as well, more of looking at the future. Uh, so uh, if you don't have any question now, just uh, you know, uh, think about it during the break. So we have a coffee break now uh, and let's uh, resume back in, uh, is it in half an hour? Yeah, is in half an hour. Uh, to move to the um, more into the conversational information uh, seeking systems, so more IR part, uh, and also the the social board uh, aspect. Any questions for these parts? All right. So enjoy your break, and uh, we'll see you back in uh, half an hour. All right. Let's uh, let's resume, and uh, as people are, are coming in, um, so uh, so far we have uh, we have covered. Uh, Let's say the one uh, uh, the, the first half of the tutorial, uh, we talked a bit about uh, the evaluation of uh, the generated data. Uh, so how do you know whether your generated data is good to train your um, your dialogue systems? Uh, so if you if you already have example of uh, training data, you can use them as references and then get blue scores, BERT scores, BART scores against uh, these references. If you don't have any reference data uh, to check quality, then people check secondary qualities, uh, like uh, how they versus the, the kind of the training data and so on and so forth. Uh, then we move to the task-oriented systems, where systems that they try to solve specific tasks, uh, and we want to generate data to train these systems. So we saw, in a sense, a breakdown of their work that uh, uh, happens in the literature uh, with, uh, and, and in principle, the question there is, do you already have a database of uh, entities that you want to retrieve? Do you have a database of restaurants, for example? And uh, if you do, then you can think of how do we generate data? You can think uh, that we sample from this database. So we pick a restaurant, we make this restaurant the goal of the, of the simulated user, okay? so. Uh, this restaurant comes with its attributes, so we assume that this is the restaurant the user wants to book, and then we have a system that generates data based on this restaurant. So it picks some attributes to consider that these attributes are given from the user. So I want a restaurant in Orlando for tonight. So these are two attributes for that from that restaurant, and then uh, we have a system that tries to fill in the other slots by asking questions about the other slots and a fake user that gives answer about the other slots and so at the end of the day we get a dialogue now how the, the text is being generated sometimes we have templates so the early days you just had templates and then you you know you create a di the dialogue and then somehow you paraphrase it so you have models that paraphrase the dialogue later on Along with this input, you would have a little bit of training data, so you would learn how to generate uh, text. And so this was one method, set of methods. And then the other set of methods, you wouldn't have this 
database of restaurants, right? But you would have some small training data of dialogues around restaurants. So imagine you had, uh, you know, 100 dialogues around restaurants, then you would train a model to kind of repeat the same time of type, type of dialogues. And as Roxana said, if it is completely data driven, so if it is completely, uh, you know, if, if you build a system to create data on, on the basis of a smaller data set uh, of existing data, then you may create data that do not exist. So you may, you know, create a dialogue about restaurants that do not exist. Uh, and that's when you need this quality checking. So now in the second part, uh, in the third part, let's say of the tutorial, we will talk about uh, conversational information seeking uh, uh, systems and how we generate conversations for these systems. And then the last part will be the social board. So more of the open open domain. Um, so I give the floor uh, to Haider uh, that will uh, uh, cover uh, this part. So here in this part, we uh, will uh, talk about the conversation generation for the uh, conversational information seeking. Uh, the main goal of the, this system is to fulfill the user's information need. And uh, these systems allow uh, users to search information using the natural dialogue instead of uh, just tra traditional uh, search queries. Uh, but these systems have some challenges to uh, fulfill their users uh, need. Uh, one of the main uh, challenges uh, is that uh, they need to control the generation process. That means uh, they need to uh, follow the conversation coherently to uh, generate the response that's relevant to the history of the conversation. And also uh, maybe uh, the user asked the, uh, we can say complicated uh, question that, and the uh, system uh, need to uh, search for multiple documents and generate the answer regarding the multiple uh, evidence. And also we have uh, the query ambiguity that that means that uh, maybe uh, the system uh, find multiple potential answers and uh, it needs to ask the user which one is more relevant or maybe uh, the system uh, doesn't uh, find uh, the appropriate or, or doesn't find the appropriate result and uh, or doesn't understand the uh, user's question and it needs to ask uh, the user about uh, uh, about the question. So uh, to develop a, a convers inform a conversational information seeking system, uh, we need to uh, handle these challenges and we need to encapsulate these challenges in the uh, generating training data. Uh, mainly, we can uh, say that the generation process uh, can be uh, defined in the three main steps. The first one is the input generation, uh, the second one is the utterance generation, and the last one is the quality filtering. So in the input generation, uh, the component takes the unstructured data. It means uh, maybe it's documents or the knowledge graph or uh, the embedded knowledge in the uh, LLMs. And uh, it tries to generate a structured information card. We can call this information card, uh, which means it contains some information that the conversation will be involved uh, around these uh, topics and information. Uh, so for example, here we have the uh, conversation seed. So this information card in the uh, literature of the data generation uh, called uh, conversation seed. So for example, here we have a conversation seed that contains some information about the entity. And also it uh, contains the conversation starter, which uh, try to, which is the question that starts the conversation. And also we have a dialogue follow. So what is the dialogue follow? Uh, in information seeking conversation, uh, the goal is to uh, generate or to fulfill the user's need. Uh, so uh, each turn of the conversation try to approach or to uh, get closer to uh, responding to the user. So each turn uh, has a, uh, we can say has a rule for, uh, for, for the whole conversation. Uh, 
so if we can say that each each turn has a rule, so we can say that the multi turn conversation can be uh, contributed to the uh, the sequence of the dialogue acts that uh, control the conversation. So uh, regarding the generating conversation for information seeking, we need to define this dialogue flow, this sequence of the dialogue act, and uh, we can ground the conversation on it. Uh, so we can see here in the conversation seat that the dialogue act also uh, is defined and uh, it contains a, a dialogue, uh, the sequence of the dialogue acts that we can, uh, uh, we can assign to the each term. The second component is the autoast generator, uh, which convert the conversation seed to the conversation sample or conversation data set. And uh, maybe it's uh, work by prompting or uh, even by fine tuning a LLM to uh, convert this. We will discuss about the different approaches for autoast generation. Uh, so for example, here we uh, see that the our conversation seed is converted to the conversation sample and each turn of the conversation uh, has the intent which is mapped to the dialogue below. Uh, so the last component is the quality filtering which eliminates the uh, samples, the conversations that uh, do not have the standard, the quality, the standard of the quality that we need and uh, they may uh, done by some heuristic rules or maybe by uh, some methods that we will discuss about. Uh, so uh, we will uh, delve into the each component. First, the input generation. Uh, for the conversation information seeking, we can say that we have two approaches. The first one is the document driven, and the second one is the sequence grounded. Uh, but uh, first, let's uh, talk about the conversation uh, seed and the dialogue flow. As we mentioned, that each conversation uh, involves around the topic, and uh, maybe it's the start from the some general concepts of the topic, and then uh, goes to the details. So, for generating a sample of the conversation, we need to define this topic. Uh, so, in the conversation seed, we're gonna have the main topic and maybe some uh, subtopics and also some key details about the about that topic and the second uh and second section of the conversation seat uh it's a dialogue flow that is the uh like comprehensive perspective of the conversation and it's the and the conversation will uh will be grounded on it uh, so, for instance, here we have an example of the dog to dial, which is the information seeking data set. And uh, the, conversa uh, the conversation set contains a title and a document and also a dialogue flow. And uh, we can see that each term is assigned to the dialogue flow and a grounded passages uh, that uh, the, uh, the, the, the dialogue term is generated based on that. Uh, so the first approach for the input generation or the conversation seed generation is a document do even. Uh, by, uh, but uh, why documents are used for the uh, information seeking data generation? The high, uh, high quality documents are uh, typically written by and edited by the experts. And uh, these documents uh, begin with a broad uh, concept of the subject and then uh, it uh, goes to the some specific of the uh, of this topic, so it has a flow, and uh, this flow can be used uh, for generating a conversation. Uh, the first way to convert these uh, documents to the conversation is the in-painting approach, and uh, the idea is that that the document can be uh, we can say a document is uh, like a dialogue between the writer and the imaginary reader. So the writer, uh, so each sentence of the document is the answer of the uh, writer to the reader. Uh, and based on this uh, assumption, uh, we can see that the, each uh, turn of the document can be mapped to the sentence, uh, to the turn of the conversation. 
Uh, so here uh, the dialogue below is directly the document sentences. So we can see in this example that a document, uh, like three parts of the document map to the three terms of the conversation. And at the next part, try to generate the, uh, the, uh, the sentence of the reader. Uh, the second approach for document driven is the document segmentation. So here the document is segmented into multiple passages and a passage ranker uh, aim to select the most relevant passage for the for generating the current term. So here the document, uh, the dialogue flow is not fixed and not predefined and it's generated during the utterance generation maybe or during the conversation generation. Uh, but we can say that uh, the, these uh, selected passages are, uh, are related to each other because they are selected based on the conversation history. So uh, meaning, uh, so they, the, the fellow has a, uh, is meaningfully generated. So it's uh, also uh, an approach for defining a dialogue fellow. And uh, another method is that uh, the whole document is considered as the input uh, for the generating the conversation, for generating the utterance. So here, uh, indeed, all, uh, the whole document uh, is, con is uh, considered as the seed, and uh, the, the utterance generation will decide, to, uh, will decide to which part of the conversation can be used for generating these steps. But the uh, but the actually the ex the experimental result shows that also the utterance generation follow the uh, flow of the document. So we can see in this example that the first question is generated from the upper uh, part of the document, and the second question from the middle part, and also the last question is from the uh, the last part of the document. So what we have so far is that the document driven uh, input generation, and also the input can be defined uh, based on the sequence, or we can call it the sequence grounded uh, input. So in the sequence grounded, the input contains two parts. The first part is the topic with uh, background knowledge, and this uh, topic and background knowledge can be selected from the uh, existing crowdsourcing data set and also can be generated uh, by giving a list of topics and ask LLM to generate. So we will talk about the generation process. And the second part is the a sequence of dialogue acts. Uh, so, uh, and the most important feature that this sequence of the dialogue acts uh, could be have is that uh, it's, uh, it could be valid. It means that the sequence could be uh, coherently connected to each other. Uh, so we can define the uh, realistic conversation based on it. And we will talk about the uh, how we can generate the valid sequence. Uh, so, okay, first uh, we will talk about the generation of the background information. Uh, the common practice for uh, defining a topic or background information for generating a conversation is using the crowdsourcing data set. Uh, because they, uh, each uh, sample in this crowdsourcing data set uh, contains a description that can be used as a good starting point for the uh, for the converse for generating a synthetic conversation. Uh, but also this discussion uh, raised that uh, maybe if we want to use LLM to generate a synthetic conversation, we need uh, to the we need that the knowledge uh, that we provide for generating uh, the LLM should be actually seen this knowledge in the pre-training uh, phase to generate a high quality uh, conversation. So it uh, it's could be a good idea that we ask LLM to generate this knowledge for us. Uh, so here in the paper called SOLID, they do that and uh, they uh, prompt LLM to generate, we can say everything. Uh, they first uh, generate the entity type and then they generate uh, uh, some entity for the specific entity type, and they ask uh, LLM to generate a background document for that. 
So at the end of the day, they have a conversation seat that contains uh, the entity with uh, different uh, information and also background documents. So uh, this regarding the generating background information, and now we can discuss about uh, generating the uh, sequence of the act or dialogue acts. Uh, and uh, we need to indeed to check the validity of the sequence. Uh, the first way uh, uh, we can uh, uh, split the dialogue acts to the fixed and also to the open one. The fixed, it means that uh, before generating the conversation, they define the whole uh, path of the dialogue acts, the whole sequence of the dialogue acts. Uh, so for example, they can sample a dialogue, uh, this uh, sequence of the dialogue acts from the existing dialogue data set. For example, Solid uh, does that. And they uh, sample a full path of the dialogue acts from the existing uh, dialogue data set, the MS dial. And also, uh, this uh, sequence of the dialogue acts can be defined partially. It means that maybe uh, the, just the starting point and the target can be defined and let the LLM or let the generator uh, to uh, follow the path that they want. So for example, in top DL, they just uh, define the starting point and the target, and they uh, do some analysis to see the LLM follow which path. And also another way to uh, ensure the validity of the dial of the sequence of the dialogue acts is that to map this uh, dialogue acts to the embedding space and uh, they uh, based on the closeness they uh, sample uh, the sample a, a sequence of the dialogue acts. Uh, so here in the work the talk which uh, proposed to generate the conversation for the music recommendation system. Uh, they do that, they uh, input the all uh, item collection to the embedding space and the, then based of the closeness, they select a path and uh, we can see at the, uh, the second, uh, at the third step, they have a, a sequence of the system slot, the slots. Also this dialogue as uh, could be open, so, Maybe uh, the system just uh, defines some uh, dialogue acts and uh, put the like the dialogue act classifier to uh, select each one each dialogue for per train for per, uh, per generating a term. So before generating a term of the conversation, first the dialogue act classifier select the dialogue act of the current term, and then based on this selected dialogue act, the term is generated. So what we have so far is that in the input, we have a, a, as the output of the input generation, we have a conversation seed that contains a topic and a dialogue uh, flow. And now based on this uh, topic and backyard information and dialogue flow, we want to uh, generate the terms of the conversation. And uh, here we have three ways to uh, generate the utterance the, uh, of the, uh, indeed the terms of the conversation. Uh, the first one is in painting. So just to recap, here the dialogue below is uh, the document sentences. So we directly use the document sentences and we want to uh, fine tune a model to reconstruct a dialogue. It means that we have a part of the dialogue and we want to generate the other part of the dialogue. Uh, so the motivation, the real world motivation of this test is that it's like uh, someone just over uh, hearing the uh, conversation, the phone conversation, and he uh, tries to uh, infer that uh, what the other side says, something like that. So the task can be defined like taking a partial dialogue and generating the complete dialogue. And to do that, we have two phases. The first one is the training. Uh, in the training, we have a dialogue sample and we masked one of the utterance, uh, one of the utterance 
uh, randomly and then uh, the model try uh, to predict this uh, mask uh, utterances. And uh, the second phase is the inference that uh, here uh, the document is transferred to the dialogues and uh, this can be done sequentially. So first the first sentences is uh, predicted and then based on the these uh, sentences, the second sentences, uh, the second sentence is predicted. Uh, the concept of the in-painting also have some other examples. Uh, so if you remember, we have a dialogue flow uh, which contains a music playlist. Uh, in this approach, they also use the in-painting and they uh, try to generate the user's uh, request for the uh, given playlist. So here, instead of a document sentences, we have a, a music playlist and again, we can use the in-painting for, for it. And the second uh, approach, uh, for a uh, document driven input uh, input data set is uh, using the answer extraction and uh, and question generation. So here the dialogue uh, was not fixed and uh, we have a passage ranker to uh, select a passage before generating a turn of the conversation. And now uh, in the utterance generation, we have a span extraction which means it's highlight a part of the passage uh, that we want to generate a term. And also uh, we have a user and agent utterance generation. So we will focus on this part uh, in the utterance generation. Uh, the first component is uh, works like that, given a passage and the conversation history, it highlights a part of the passage that uh, the dialogue terms uh, will be generated based on them. And for the user and agent authors generation, given the highlighted passage and the conversation history, uh, the user authors and the agent authors uh, will be generated. And also uh, there is a discussion that uh, like it's better that we first have the extract the answer and then generate the question, or it's uh, better to first generate a question and uh, then we find the answer. So uh, in the paper called SimSeq, they uh, they actually uh, try to find the answer to, for this research question. So they have this setting. Uh, the Conversation seed contains a Wikipedia document, which contains a background information and also the evidence passage. And uh, for the symmetric version, they first extract an answer from the passage, and then they uh, generate a question grounded on the extracted answer and also uh, the passage. And for the asymmetric version, uh, they just uh, generate a question based on the background, which is contained a summary of the Wikipedia document. And then uh, based on the, this question, they try to find answer in the uh, evidence passage. So here in the uh, symmetric one, uh, first the answer extracted and the question uh, generated restricted to this answer. Uh, we have the coherency here, but uh, indeed uh, the question generator like limited to the uh, predetermined answer. But uh, for the asymmetric one, uh, the question is generated uh, based on the summary. So uh, the questioner can ask any, any questions relevant to the topic. So this encourages the information seeking behavior. And uh, the third uh, approach for generating the utterance is the LLM guided simulated approach, which is the most recent approach uh, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, actually field. Uh, we can, uh, actually I leave this part for Evangelist to Right, so. Right, so let me recap uh, for a second here. So basically uh, to generate these dialogues, uh, uh, we do, uh, we need two things. 
uh, when you try to generate dialogue, it has to be about a topic, right? So where do you get the topic, uh, right? So this uh, oftentimes this comes from a document. So you take a Wikipedia page and you say, okay, I'm gonna do a dialogue now on this page, right? So that's uh, that's uh, how the topic uh, comes into place. The second thing is like, okay, once you have a topic, you need to generate these terms of dialogues, but somehow you know you need to figure out how do you jump from question to question, right? So you start with a question, right? Who's Lionel Messi? Okay, then there is an answer. And then you need to, to follow up to the next question, right? So, and then there is a, uh, so there is a flow in this dialogue that you need to figure out how the dialogue flows, right? So you, should you, uh, how do you pick the next question to ask, right? So in the, in the previous methods, what we've seen is that there are different ways of doing this flow. One is just follow the flow of the, of the Wikipedia page, right? So uh, the first uh, sentence of Wikipedia says, Lionel Messi is a footballer in, or used, used to be a football player. Uh, he played for, Bar and the second sentence is like he played for Barcelona. So natural next question would be, which team did he play for, right? So you just follow the flow of the, of the, of the, uh, of the document. And then there are methods that try to make it a little bit more interesting than just following the flow of the, of the, of the document and generating questions and answers. Now, the second way is how do we generate these questions and answers, right? So what the Haida has presented so far is like, okay, you take the next sentence, let's say, or the sentence that, you know, you have to talk about in the next turn, and then you extract an answer from there. So how do you extract an answer? Typically an answer, it can be an entity. So you pick an entity out of there, and then based on this entity and the sentence, you train a model to generate a question, right? So we have a lot of question generation models. So if you take a sentence and an entity as an answer, you can always train a model to generate a question that this entity will be the answer to, right? So if you have Barcelona and the sentence is Lionel Messi played for Barcelona, then you can uh, generate, you have a, a gener generative model that says, uh, converts this to which team did uh, Lionel Messi play for, okay? Um, and so basically by having these seeds, having the, uh, the conversation flow and a way to generate questions and answers, you can build this, uh, these dialogues. Now, in what we have here, uh, we, we now, in, instead of doing that, instead of uh, uh, um, you know, starting from a topic and having this uh, generation of questions and answers that uh, follow a particular flow, we're gonna start simulating, right? So instead of, of doing that, we will have a, a language model that in principle uh, plays the user and a language model that in principle uh, plays uh, uh, the, the system. And we, we will see a bunch of different ways of having the language model generating this data. So the first one is a very simple one in which essentially uh, what you have is uh, uh, basically uh, on one hand, uh, you um, uh, you have a, a language model and then you actually have an, an, an actual user, okay? So basically here, we don't have a fully automated uh, synthesis of conversational data, but instead you have an actual user and then you have an LLM that uh, if you give to the LLM the right information, it can, uh, it can uh, generate uh, a dialogue as it is conversing, as it is conversing with, the, uh, with the user. So in this paper, the labs paper, um, people uh, uh, identified a bunch of, of uh, components, sorry, of, of things that need to happen. So basically the dialogue acts that uh, we, we talked about, right? So when you uh, start, when you, you are in the middle of a dialogue, right? What do you need to do next? So the LLM should know what to do next. Should it greet the user? Should it uh, offer uh, 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 different choices from which the user should pick something? Should it recommend something? Ask a follow-up question? Uh, or uh, you know say bye to the user. Uh, so this part is uh, uh, is is a starting of the dialogue, right? So you you need to know what do you need to do next, and then there is the sort of the uh, the guidance to the to the to the dialogue generation. So now uh, the LLM would guide the 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 user to generate the the um, the next uh, the next dialogue. So basically, you have a user there that is supported by the LLM, uh, uh, it would start the dialogue by saying, hi, I'm interested in this. And then the LLM would present some sort of brainstorm, some next idea for the user to continue on the dialogue, right? So the LLM is there to support the user 
to support the user in building dialogue. So imagine that you uh, really have, uh, uh, so this is not a synthetic generation of data, but you have a real user and the, and the LLM is supporting this user into how to follow, uh, into how, how to follow up uh, the, the, the dialogue there. I'm gonna, right. So um, <clears throat> now, if we move into the, uh, uh, the to the real simulation, so now, so so uh, uh, in this uh, in this case, what we have is what we want to do is we we want to uh, actually have two LLMs talking to each other, right? So this is the ultimate goal. We don't want any user in there. So in principle, we want now to build a, a, a dialogue system uh, without any user there. So we will focus again on the idea of starting from a Wikipedia page, right? But instead of uh, following the flow exactly of the Wikipedia page, what we do is we give the Wikipedia page, we, we split the Wikipedia page into two parts. So we say, okay, this is the, the part that a, teach, a student will know, right? So imagine that we give to the student only the abstract of the Wikipedia page that covers the topic broadly. So it talks about Lionel Messi being a footballer, blah, blah, blah. So it gives only the beginning of the, of the Wikipedia. And then a teacher model has the entire Wikipedia, right? So imagine that, so this simulates a teacher that knows everything about the topic Lionel Messi or everything about the topic of uh, how do we, uh, you know, uh, uh, create new proteins. And then the, the student only knows the beginning of this topic, right? So an abstract idea about this topic. And so now what we simulate is we simulate a student asking questions to the teacher that is very much, much more knowledgeable. So the first uh, LLM will have the beginning of a Wikipedia and the second LLM will have access to the entire uh, Wikipedia page. And so through this paper, the, the, the authors um, essentially dictate to the LLMs how they should interact with each other, uh, making the student ask the next question to uncover parts of the knowledge that it doesn't have access to. And here is uh, obviously there are a lot of challenges, right? So if you have two LLMs that like GPT-4, for instance, that they have already read the Wikipedia, right? How do you make the student really focus, assume that it doesn't know much about the Wikipedia page? Uh, and how do you do this? Does the student ask a next question that can be answered by the Wikipedia page, right? So it gets a little bit tricky into how do you instruct these LLMs to converse. But the idea here is exactly that, that you have two LLMs, one plays the student role, the other plays the teacher role. The student has limited access to knowledge, the teacher has full access to knowledge, and then you try to instruct them to play uh, this, uh, this game. All right. Um, and again, as I said, there are uh, there are challenges here. Of, uh, for instance, when a student asks a question, given that it doesn't know what kind of knowledge the teacher has, right? It may ask questions that cannot be answered based on the Wikipedia page. So things can go out of control in this uh, sort of uh, simulations. And if you look into the papers, uh, into the particular paper, you will see a lot of ways that uh, the authors try to contain the language models to talk about these particular Wikipedia page uh, only. Okay. Um, then um, uh, let me go to the uh, to, to one more work that again here, uh, there is a simulation between uh, uh, LLMs. And this is the, the work that uh, Hader presented at the, at the very beginning, where again, uh, now uh, what the authors did is says, okay, I'm not gonna have two LLMs, but I'm going to have one LLM that plays the role of the teacher and the student uh, uh, alone. And so what I'm going to do is that uh, I will not give any input information to this LLM. So I will not uh, uh, explicitly focus on a single Wikipedia page, for instance. But what I'm going to do is I will ping the LLM to uh, bring up from its own uh, you know, internal knowledge a particular topic that it knows well about. Right, so I will say, okay, give me an entity. The LLM will produce an entity from its internal knowledge. Then I will say, okay, what do you know about this entity? This entity? Then it may give me, uh, you know, a beginning of uh, of uh, this uh, sort of a background information on this entity. And then I will ask, uh, I will instruct the LLM 
to ask the first question about this entity. And then I will instruct the LLM to give an answer about this entity. And by instructing the LLM to uh, go around this entity that it has it, itself generated, I can generate a sequence of, uh, of questions and answers. Now, um, interestingly enough, uh, when we did this work, uh, uh, it is very likely that the LLM will hallucinate and produce entities that don't exist. And uh, in principle, it will continue the conversation, a very realistic conversation about these entities that do not exist. Uh, and the question that uh, comes up, of course, is, does it, is it really harmful to hallucinate at the level of generating training data? Because in principle, we can still train dialogue systems on this hallucinated data. And it appeared that it is not as harmful as we, we would think to train dialogue systems on this hallucinated data. It's, it's, uh, it, it doesn't harm. At the end of the day, when you have a real user, uh, what the entity, what the, the dialogue system does, does not hallucinate anymore because the user will always ground the conversation to something. Right. Um, so. I think these are yes. So that then uh, uh, these are the so in principle. What uh, let me uh, uh, conclude this part. So in principle, what we have uh, again here is we have a single LLM that really plays two roles, right? So instead of having two LLMs, a teacher and a student, where each LLM gets a different snippet of information, the student gets a limited information and the teacher gets a lot of information. Now we have a single LLM. But somehow through our instructions, we try, we try to uh, create two personalities of this LLM, once one personality that is like a student that asks the next question, and one personality that is like a teacher. And the way uh, this happens is through the instructions, we, we, we really try to squeeze in uh, how the LLM should, should behave. All right, so uh, this is how we generate data. And then as uh, Haydar said, uh, oftentimes this data, um, uh, the way we generate them, uh, uh, we generate conversations of low quality. Now, what does it mean to have conversations of low quality? Uh, one thing that it uh, definitely means is that uh, in uh, the answers to some of the questions we generate are wrong, right? So if I say, if the conversation that is generated when I give Barcelona and uh, a sentence uh, is, uh, you know, if, if uh, uh, instead of asking which team Lionel Messi played for, it asks which team Lionel Messi uh, uh, managed, right? I mean, you never know. It, it is a generative model, so that such a question may happen, right? Then we, we have a, a, a wrong question and answer pair, right? So we have which uh, uh, team Lionel Messi managed, and the answer becomes, uh, Barcelona, right? So we we need to uh, first of all we need to filter for this kind of uh, of mistakes. Uh, so there is something that is called round trip consistency. This is very standard when you build this kind of data. So round trip consistency, what you do essentially is you generate you you start with an answer, you generate the question, hoping that the answer to this question is the, the answer you started from. So you create a question and answer pair. And then instead of stopping there, you actually use a system to try to answer this question. So you now use a question answering system to try to answer whether, you know, which uh, team Lionel Messi managed. And if the, the question, if the answer comes back and it's not Barcelona, because in this case, it may not be Barcelona, right? Since Lionel Messi did not manage Barcelona, right? Then you say, okay, we have a mismatch here. We didn't do, it is not consistent in a round, round trip way. It's not consistent the other way around. So I'm gonna, um, uh, so I'm gonna throw away uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, question, right? So there is this factuality check that uh, can happen through this round trip uh, consistency. Uh, people have come up with other ways of uh, doing uh, filtering. So oftentimes we see that extremely long dialogues, right? If you let LLMs uh, simulate and they go over and over and they create a lot of turns, it is very likely that extremely long dialogues, they get hallucinated or they get out of uh, the topic, uh, they shift and they drift away. Uh, so people also uh, created filtering uh, uh, mechanisms that try to look a little bit of, of, uh, uh, of how long this conversation is. Now, this creates some kind of biases towards short conversations. So also what people did is 
they went back to some of the metrics that the FIS showed us in the in the beginning where we talked about evaluation, right? So they, the uh, metrics that have to do with the diversity of the conversation, um, how many, for instance, uh, 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 so the coherence of the conversation, right? So if we create conversations that are not very coherent, maybe we want to throw those conversations away. Now, the cool thing here is that we have automatic ways of creating conversations. So people actually create tons of conversations and then they come back, they use some of these filtering approaches that most of them are a bit ad hoc. So they have trained systems and they've seen that they don't work very well. So they try to find filtering uh, um, metrics to cut down these conversations and, uh, and throw away parts of it that they don't uh, seem to help the dialogue systems. All right, uh, and with uh, that, uh, I think uh, we, we, we have finished the, the part on the uh, information seeking uh, dialogues. And uh, is, is there any question on this part? Overall, just to, to sum up, right? So we want to build dialogues that they provide information to the user about a particular topic. Uh, there are, in principle, a very simple way of doing that. You pick a topic and then you start creating dialogue over this topic. How you pick a topic is interesting. You can pick a topic by choosing a particular document. You can pick a topic by pinging an LLM to give you a topic. Uh, you can pick a topic by combining documents all together in one, you know, uh, sort of uh, a set of documents, and this will be your topic. Then how you build the conversation is also very challenging, right? What is the, how do you build questions? What's the next question to ask? These are questions that the literature, uh, literature covers. Um, I'm going to give the floor back to Haydar to finish up with the open domain uh, now uh, dialogues. These open domain dialogues are the sort of the simplest form where in principle, uh, it's a social bot that you, you chat with on any kind of domain. It doesn't have a task uh, in, uh, in, in, in mind. Uh, and in principle, uh, but it, it, also, it is also challenging in the sense that uh, the dialogues you generate, they have to be coherent. They have to be interesting to some extent informative, right? You, you, you know, you, when, some, when a user says I'm interested in football, yeah, you shouldn't discuss dancing after that, right? And if you discuss football, you should say something interesting and not something, something boring. So it continues engaging uh, with the user. So the hater will continue on that. Yes, as Ivan just mentioned that the open domain dialogue is kind of the simplest uh, form of the dialogue of the conversation seeking dialogue. So here, uh, uh, we only need uh, the topic in the input generation, so we don't need the uh, indeed the flow of the conversation because we just want to uh, generate a dialogue for a specific topic, and it's uh, like simulate or mimic the uh, the daily conversation that we have. That we start with a topic, and when uh, and then we uh, we are engaging in the topic, and maybe we ask some specific about the topic and something like that. So uh, the input generation in the open domain is just uh, uh, aim to generate uh, a description or, uh, or just introduce a topic for starting the conversation. So for instance, here we have a knowledge graph and uh, after uh, multiple steps, uh, a description based on the triplet of the knowledge graph is generated, uh, which can be used for uh, generating a multi-term conversation. And uh, in the autons generation, uh, on the battery is low. Okay, in the autons generation, uh, the main uh, focus is to convert this uh, info, uh, this conversation seed to the uh, conversation sample. Uh, so here we can see that the this this uh, description that generated based on the no, uh, triplet of the knowledge graph is uh, converted to the multi-term uh, conversation. And uh, the last step is the quality filtering, as we mentioned that this quality uh, uh, this uh, filtering is uh, eliminate the samples that do not uh, have the uh, main features of the uh, open domain system. Uh, 
again, we first talk about the input generation. So as we mentioned, the conversation series just contain the topic, but how we can uh, define this uh, topic. Uh, the, the first way is to uh, use the, uh, the conversation data. So each uh, conversation data is crowdsourcing conversation data, uh, data mainly contain a background information. So we can uh, use this background information as the starting point of the uh, generating the, synth the synthetic data. Uh, and also uh, we can ask human to generate the, uh, this background information given a list of the uh, topics. Uh, this is important because uh, indeed uh, this uh, starting point is important because uh, it ensures the quality of the conversation. So if we have a, a well-written description we can have a uh, we can have the like coherent uh, conversation. So uh, because of that, and uh, some uh, some papers like places ask human to generate the background information, and also it asked a human to generate some samples of the conversation that uh, will be used as a few shot uh, as a few shot examples for uh, prompting an LLM to generate a conversation. And also other uh, textual resources can be used uh, to generate these descriptions, uh, for example, a knowledge graph. And this is because that in some domains, uh, we have uh, a scarcity of the uh, conversational data. So we can uh, convert uh, all the textual, uh, other textual uh, resources that not like knowledge graphs to, uh, to a description, and then we can convert this description to the conversation. So for example, SODA uh, generates a description based on the triplet of the knowledge graph. They first uh, sample a, a, a triplet and then they uh, define a conversation participants. And then using some uh, uh, predefined templates uh, customized based on the relation of the triplet, they convert this triplet to the sentence and then they ask the LLM to generate a description based on the, this sentence, and this description can be used as a conversation seed. And also in the open domain, we have personalized dialogue system. In the personalized dialogue system, the answer is uh, generated based on the, some uh, personalized information. Uh, so each uh, user, each participant of the conversation has a profile, a user profile, and each user profile uh, contains several uh, profile sentences. So, at, uh, so we can say that uh, the conversation seed contains two profile sentences and based on the uh, two, profile, uh, two user profiles and based on these two user profiles, the conversation will be generated. Uh, for generating these uh, user profiles, first uh, we can collect or generate a pool of profile sentences. So we can use the Again, we can use the crowdsourcing data sets to uh, and, and use the uh, profile user profiles. And also we can uh, ask or prompt LLM to generate more profile sentences for us. For example, we can see the prompt that uh, personal chat uh, gen used to generate more profile uh, sentences uh, for, from di for different topics. And then we need to group a number of profile sentences to create a user profile. And uh, it's important that these uh, profile sentences are relevant to each other. So here, an example of the uh, unrelevant uh, profile sentences. So we can see that in this profile, there are two sentences that are completely against each other. Uh, so for uh, grouping a profile sentences to have a valid user profile, uh, mainly in a like classifier use. It's a, like a common uh, approach that uh, it's a classifier that detect uh, which sentences are uh, relevant to each other. And then we uh, have a filtering a step. So maybe this profile sentence is generated based on some entities and uh, uh, these uh, heuristic rules can be used uh, for filtering for check whether that these entities uh, are in the profile sentences or not. And uh, so at the end of the input generation, 
we have a conversation see that contains a topic or for the personalized dialogue system, uh, it contains a, a user profiles. And then in this step, we want to convert the conversation seat to the conversation sample. Uh, so for the open domain dialogue system, mainly uh, the one go generation is used. It means that uh, the user, the conversation seat is a, a the LLM prompted with this conversation C to generate a multi-term at once, but uh, for some reasons, the 10 by 10 generation also used. And we will discuss about the reasons that uh, ones used to uh, generate 10 by 10. So first way for generating uh, one go, uh, so generating in one go approach is just to only prompt uh, without any fine tuning. Uh, so for example, here we have a conversation and a topic and uh, prompt an LLM to generate the conversation sample based on the given topics. Or maybe uh, first uh, the, uh, an, uh, an LLM is fine-tuned and then uh, prompt to generate a conversation. So for example, here we can see that it uh, fine-tuned a given a description and the first utterance, and then uh, it's prompt to generate a conversation. And the uh, last approach use the generator critic uh, setting uh, for generating a conversation. In this setting, uh, in the first step, the generator generates some conversation candidates uh, given the seed and some uh, examples, some conversation examples. And at the second step, uh, the critic uh, evaluator evaluate the the conversation candidates uh, regarding some policies. And these policies is the some evaluation metrics. Uh, so here uh, at the end of this uh, step, uh, the best conversations is uh, selected. And, the, and uh, at the third step, this, uh, uh, co this selected conversation is added to the data set and the generator use this uh, new or uh, new generated conversation for generating the uh, for the next iteration. Uh, and uh, the experimental result shows that this uh, iterative approach can improve the performance of the generator. But as we mentioned, uh, some approach also use the turn by turn generation, uh, and uh, they have some reasons for to do that. The first one is that if we have uh, two personal profiles, also it's uh, possible that we uh, prompt one LLM by two uh, user profiles to generate a conversation, but uh, sometimes maybe uh, ones can use two LLMs and each uh, in the form of the user simulation and each LLM uh, prompt by a user profile and then they start to talk to each other uh, turn by turn to generate the full conversation. Also, another a way to generating a conversation is uh, indeed to generating a multi-skill conversation. The conversation that can uh, talk about the multi-skills is uh, merging a multiple conversation that just uh, uh, specify for one skill. So in this setting, uh, for generating the each turn, we need to check the dialogue history and we check that, okay, which a conversation, which the data set can be used for generating the for uh, for the next step. So here also uh, ones use the turn by turn approach. And the last reason is the uh, increasing the diversity and the quantity of the data. So by uh, using the turn by turn, different scenarios can be defined. Uh, so for instance, here uh, uh, in one approach here. Uh, the people uh, use that, okay, we have a original conversation. We keep the first two terms and then we we generate the uh, third one. And maybe in another approach, we can uh, select the third first terms and then generate the uh, fourth term. So as we see different scenarios can be used and can be defined for generating the conversation. And just by having one original conversation, we can have multiple synthetic conversations. Uh, and the last component is the uh, quality filtering. Uh, the filtering uh, 
can be divided into uh, in two categories. The first one is the noise and lexical filtering, which just check the correctness and the diversity of the generated conversation. They use some historic uh, heuristic rules to uh, eliminate the uh, like the unfinished conversation or the conversation that do not follow the patterns or uh, the conversations that have some toxic uh, context. And also we have the consistency filtering regarding the terms and also regarding the personal uh, sentences uh, that mainly they use the NLI classifiers to uh, do that. So uh, this was the open domain uh, conversation generation. And uh, I give the floor to the Evangelist to conclude our session. Okay, so as we approach to the to the end, uh, let me just uh, um, summarize what we have so far. Um, for the three, so what we have done is we've split the dialogue systems into three sort of categories, the task oriented, uh, the information seeking and the open domain uh, chatbots. Um, and uh, there is a really a plethora of, of methods that have been proposed in generating uh, data. Uh, so if we look at the, each one of the three um, types of systems, uh, let's start with the task oriented first. So uh, in principle, the challenge in the task oriented when you, you build data to train task oriented uh, dialogue systems, uh, the key challenge is that uh, your dialogues cannot be free. Uh, the, you, you, it's not like the open domain or the information seeking that you talk about a topic, right? Your dialogues have constraints and these constraints are uh, constraints that uh, they come from the task you want to solve uh, in the domain you want to solve it, right? So when you book a restaurant, you can't have a generic dialogue. You have to definitely in the dialogue, uh, you need to account for what it means to book a restaurant, right? Or what it means to solve the task that you have, uh, you do have to, to solve. So you have a very strong dependency of how you generate your data on the uh, on the model on how you model the task and how you bring these uh, constraints of uh, what it means to solve a task into the generation of uh, the data. Uh, oftentimes, these constraints they are um, encoded in some sort of knowledge graph or a uh, knowledge base or an ontology uh, that essentially is a model is a simple model of the task you want to solve. Now, if you start uh, trying to solve complex tasks, right? Booking, for instance, your holidays, booking your holidays can be broken down in, into a lot of subtasks, right? So you have to book your, your flight, that's a task, your hotel, that's another task. Then uh, the, what you want to do during your holidays, booking different kinds of trips. For each trip, maybe you book your, your lunch or your dinners and whatever you want to do, right? And now you, you see that you have a very, integ you know, like it's, it's a big task now. And many of these things are even interconnected, right? So you can't book a restaurant before you know when you fly or you can't book a flight before you know, uh, you know, uh, when you want to go. Uh, uh, and uh, then uh, even uh, when you book uh, things to do, you need to know the route. Uh, of your of your of your uh, holidays so it depends in which uh, locations you book your hotels and so on and so forth so you you can imagine that these tasks can become extremely complex right and all these constraints need to be brought forward in into a system like an llm right a, a, a language generation system that needs to take into account all these constraints when it generates data for the dialogue. So actually generating data becomes uh, extremely cumbersome in, in these uh, sit situations. And the LLMs are extremely good as a UX uh, of generating data. So th they're very good when, you know, if, if, you, uh, if you give an input to uh, turn this input into a natural language, but um, passing all these, all these constraints of the task itself to the LLM uh, remains extremely uh, extremely difficult, right? The LLMs have not been trained, for instance, 
to take the structural uh, uh, constraints of attributes, values, slot values, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and generate dialogues like that. So there, uh, it is still um, to some extent where the challenge still remains. Um, and uh, this is where you see from a lot of uh, industrial uh, um, uh, researchers, right? Because task oriented so a lot of work in the industry. Um, so uh, where they have most of their trouble, right? So they, uh, they want to extend their dialogue system to cover the next uh, sort of uh, 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 task that their customers uh, want, but extending it is not straightforward. They need to model the whole problem again and somehow to pass these constraints into a uh, uh, way to generate data. So they have to generate data and then train their dialogue systems on this generated data. Right, so this is uh, uh, where the task-oriented uh, uh, dialogues uh, uh, are at the moment. When we move to the conversational information seeking, now here we have a, a, a much more freedom, right? What we want is eventually is we want to build a dialogue system that uh, the user can, you know, go to having an information need, right? I want to learn uh, how do I, you know, uh, uh, create the color green from natural uh, materials, okay? Right, so it's an information need. And then the system needs to uh, figure out, uh, you know, how to pass this information to the user. The user can continue questioning and uh, the system uh, can continue giving answers, right? And basically what we want to do now is we want to build this kind of, uh, of uh, data sets where the, uh, uh, where at one hand you have some sort of user that has information needs and want to discuss this information need. On the other hand, you have a system that knows the, uh, has the knowledge and gives answers to this, uh, to the user. And uh, what we also want is that these answers are somehow grounded and that's important, right? So we want the system to, in this data set we create to ground the answer. So basically for every answer to a user question, we also want to have the source of the answer. Now this makes it very difficult because um, it is very simple to start from a single document and create dialogues as we have seen, but then most of the time, the information the user wants is cross document, right? You, you have a, a conversation with a search engine and you are not specifically focusing on a single document, right? You want a multi-document grounding. Multi-document groundings, groundings do not exist in the literature, right? So you don't have any method, really any, any good method that generates training data that are grounded on multiple documents. Uh, we have seen in crowdsourcing people jumping from Wikipedia to Wikipedia page to make a multi-document conversation, but not in synthetic data. And that's one part of uh, the, the challenges in generating data for conversational information seeking. Um, again, the second thing is the flow of the conversation, right? So, okay, I want to talk about this topic and I have a user, simulated user that asks the first question, what should be the second question that the simulated user asks? Right, that's, that's how should the, the conversation flow? That's also difficult, right? If we follow the, the flow of a document, things are easy, but if we don't want to follow the flow of the document so we can sort of have a richer dialogues, a richer training data, how should we choose what's the next good question? And does it really matter, right? Uh, or, and if it matters, in what way does it matter, right? Do we just need to have some sort of uh, uh, consistency or you know anything, any next question is okay, right? So a lot of the di dialogue, a lot of the synthetic data generation uh, papers talk about how to 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 control this flow, uh, and uh, and some uh, some people try to control this flow by specifically saying that okay, here you have to ask a question, uh, and then uh, the system has to give an answer or make a question that is a bit ambiguous, make the system ask a clarifying question come up with a, a non-ambiguous question and then make the system answer. So they try to control a bit the flow of the conversation. Uh, one difficulty that we still have in generating this data is to generate data that also have this mixed initiative, right? So oftentimes we generate data that are very good for conversational question answering, where one part is a, a student that asks questions, the other part is a teacher that gives answers. 
but we don't have these more natural conversations where the system can you know ask for clarifications uh, can poke the the student to give some more information the student can be ambiguous can have uncertainty in its language and so on and so forth so we have very uh, let's say very uh, narrow uh, type of dialogues uh, that we we generate and it is still an open question how do we go with a, a sort of broader uh, dialogues and in general modeling the conversation the information seeking dialogues is an open question right for now we we just flow around the topic right we generate data by flowing around the topic but we don't have this sort of modeling that task oriented uh, dialogues have right that you know in order to answer a particular topic so if i ask you know how do i build uh, a fence right or how do i cook uh, this uh, dish right naturally as humans we know that there is a planning under underlying right that there are subtopics to, to figure out right uh, so you know for a fence for example what kind of material you want right and based on the material i'll give you different instructions right uh, how expensive should the fence be etc uh, etc et so even for for this sort of information seeking there is an underlying task right and right now we don't model it at all we don't know anything about it, it we just flow around documents uh, to build this kind of conversation so there is a lot of uh, a lot of things to be done for uh, uh, conversational information uh, seeking um, and overall if if uh, if we look at the overall um, problem of generating synthetic data uh, what we see now is that a lot of people use LLMs to generate synthetic data. Uh, and here we observe two, two key issues. Uh, first of all, LLMs are really hard to control, right? They have a knowledge that you don't really know what, what is, it is, right? So if you want to, uh, uh, like in the example, we had the student that uh, should uh, pretend that doesn't know about the topic and ask questions, right? Like making an LLM pretend that doesn't have a knowledge uh, so adding this control becomes extremely difficult, right? So we have very limited control on the kind of data that is generated by the LLM. Um, we also have very limited control regarding other other uh, other uh, senses of the data, like the the quality, uh, whether they're toxic, they're safe, and so on and so forth, right? So it, it is very hard to control uh, these parts. The second bit about the LLMs is that there is this self-reinforcement, right? So we use an LLM to generate data and then we train LLM on this data. So we kind of create a circularity. And uh, then at the end, we also have LLMs evaluating uh, how good the conversation is. So we have a third circularity, right? LLM to generate data, LLM to uh, train on this data to, to make a dialogue and, and, and an LLM to evaluate how good the dialogue is. So that's a very typical pipeline nowadays and now we see that all this uh, self -re there is a lot of self reinforcement so we know for a fact that if you use uh, chat gpt so gpt4 to tell you whether a dialogue makes sense right so whether it's natural and you know how would, would it score a dialogue it has a, already it has a bias towards dialogue generated by gpt4 and if you use uh, llama it has a, a bias towards llama generated uh, uh, dialogues right so there is this uh, self reinforcement that is uh, that is uh, there and and so that uh, that is a general challenge and then the last bit is a challenge we started with uh, so uh, this data generation is is a really a complex task and uh, uh, people really want to personalize dialogues they want to specialize for particular domains and tasks uh, so uh, it is still uh, quite challenging uh, to, uh, uh, to to generate data that can cover all kind of tasks that uh, that people are interested in um, and with these three uh, open challenges uh, i think we reached uh, to an end uh, so thank you very much for uh, for uh, following the tutorial and uh, for being here and i will be happy to to to, to have any further discussion or any answer any questions uh, you you may have so any questions or any any comments or any anything you want to 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 discuss if if anything All right. Otherwise, I'll yeah. Go ahead. So uh, we're mostly talking about, I think, data generated from the other end. 
Yes, yeah, yes, uh, absolutely. So, um, uh, for example, the, the work uh, I, uh, we presented uh, with the name SOLID, which uh, asks the LLM to come up with an entity and then uh, asks the LLM to bring uh, up a background and start a conversation. Essentially, there, uh, people looked at uh, an existing dialogue uh, data set and they, after they, so, so uh, what you described, they do it as a, most of the papers, they do it as a filtering. So th there are two types of papers. One, they use the distributions of a, a real dialogue to filter the generated dialogue. So first they generate a lot of data and then they say, okay, but you know, uh, people don't have, uh, you know, 1000 clarifying questions one after the other, right? They typically have a question and answer. Uh, or they talk about this type of entities, or they, they focus on this kind of attributes. So they, they looked at the distribution and then they filter out uh, or they balance, let's say, uh, the data by filtering out uh, parts that uh, or sampling, let's say, to follow this distribution. So this is one way. And then there is also methods that um, uh, what they do. So there, there was a bunch of methods that Roxana presented that uh, essentially we say they start without any input. So basically these methods, what they do is you have a high quality data set and then you train a data generator on this high quality data set and then uh, you use the de data generation. So in principle, it creates data following the distribution of the, of the original data set. Um, one other uh, sort of uh, line of work that uh, we did not cover at all here uh, is the, the, the pure data augmentation as we have it in, in uh, our mind, like in computer vision, right? In computer vision, you take an image and then you kind of rotate it, you blur it. So you kind of play with the input and it's the same image, but uh, you know it comes in different uh, shapes and uh, geometries and so on and so forth. So there is a lot of work that takes the original dialogues, so a high quality da dialogue data set, and then it augments it in all kinds of different ways. The simplest one is just paraphrasing or removing and adding synonyms um, and so on and so forth. So there is also this kind of work that, uh, uh, you know, augments data in the classical way of, uh, of augmentation. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Well, all right, then. Uh, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day and the rest of, uh, of the conference and your stay in Singapore. Thanks.